Hey everybody, welcome back to a special episode of Getting Out of the Machine. My name is Henry Bingaman. This episode is an Ask Me Anything. So I sent out a email to my email list and just solicited questions. It could be copywriting, it could be business, it could be life, anything. Uh, and these are the top 10 questions I got back and I'm gonna answer them all. So the first question is from Aaron. He asks, what's the biggest influence that led you to your biggest winners in financial promos? And what are the ways that we could cultivate it? So I'm gonna interpret this question as uh, kind of a style question. How do you find your big ideas for promos and, and how do we cultivate it? So my style is very much research focused. I like to dig deep. Uh, I just gave a talk last weekend at Tom Woods event in Florida and one of the things I talked about was developing your talent stack. This is a concept from Scott Adams, uh, the creator of Dilbert. So his his talent stack, the way he describes it, he wasn't the best writer, but he was pretty good. He wasn't the best illustrator, but he, he had some talent there. And he wasn't the funniest guy in the world, but he was pretty humorous. And when you put all those things together, when you stack them on top of each other, that's what allowed him to create the you know multi-million dollar brand of Dilbert. So the thing that works for me in coming up with... Uh, big financial winners especially, is it's research. I, I find a lot of different ideas. I go looking and read everything. So I know the topics better than a lot of the uh, so-called experts themselves. There was a, a promo I did a few years ago that was based on life extension technology. And I went and researched everything about RNA, DNA, all, all of the stuff that goes into, uh, so RNA transcription, how, how the cells work, all the medical research around it. And I just read dozens and dozens of medical papers. And there was a, it was funny, there was a cocktail party that I was at a couple years later, no, maybe less than a year later, because it was still fresh in my mind. And I was having a conversation with a doctor that was actually in the RNA interference field, RNAi. And we had just this really interesting back and forth. And I was asking her questions and having a good conversation. And at the end of it, she's like, so are you a doctor? Are you in research? What? I'm like, no, I'm just a writer. But my, my whole way of coming up with ideas is to know everything and then simplify it down. I, I consider myself a, more of an idea combinator than a uh, idea innovator. <laughs> so I put a lot of different ideas together to get the best idea that I can. Now there's a lot of different styles. Like you could look at somebody like uh, Chris Haddad or Dan Ferrari, really, really great copywriters, top of the game. And their best, uh, approach is opening up with a really emotional, powerful story. Uh, and then there's guys like Jed Canty, who just really understands what the market wants. So he's not usually writing promos for older products. He's coming up with new products to launch, new ideas. He, he's just really in tune with what the market wants. So I think you have to kind of develop your own style. You know, mine is research and combining different ideas. James Altucher <laughs> calls this idea sex where you come up, you, you have a lot of different ideas and you blend them together and see what comes out of it. So that's kind of my style, but I think you have to find your own. Whatever works for you best is going to be the way you're most successful. I don't think you can imitate your way to success once you get to the upper echelons of copywriting. You have to find your style and what works for you and then develop it from there. Um, so I think, yeah, my biggest influence is is just researching, coming up with ideas. This is, this is really, I guess if you want... To, to name a copywriter that influenced me a lot is Paris Lampropoulos. This is kind of his style. You read the copy and it's not, I don't want to denigrate him because he's an amazing copywriter, but it doesn't seem exciting, but you can't stop reading it. And I think that's really an amazing skill and that's what I've tried to cultivate. Gabriel asked, I've been focusing exclusively on financial since I started out, but now that the industry is going through a slump, I'm wondering whether I should diversify and work my way into other niches like health. I'm hesitant to do so because I really enjoy working in financial copy and my numbers have been pretty decent. On the other hand, I believe sticking with one thing has a compounding effect that will pay out in the long run. On the other hand, this might simply be an excuse to not try something new. So the, the current financial copywriting slump is just that the markets are changing so dramatically right now that people are scared to invest. If you go back to 2008, I think, yeah, 2008, 2007, 2009, Every, you know, the economy was in a recession. Everybody was trying to figure out what would work. And there was a few years where the copywriting numbers were really down. And then Jed Cancy and Mike Palmer, at really close to the same time, Jed came out with Aftershock. Mike Palmer came out with The End of America. And both of those promos did over $100 million. 
So there is a message out there that will work in financial. I don't think financial is dead or going anywhere. It's going through a, uh, it's not a slump, it's a figuring out period. They had to find the messages that are going to work. It wasn't really until like 2012 that the super greed focused, like this is the new big thing uh, type promo started working again in financial. On the other hand, you know, I, I think once you have some success in copywriting, you should expand out into different niches. The So there was a Joseph Campbell quote that's pretty well known that he said, follow your bliss. But he later revised that to follow your blisters. So in other words, not just follow what you love doing, follow what you put, what you're willing to put the work in on. So if you don't like health, don't go into health. But if you find that interesting, and I have, you know, my most successful promo of all time, over $100 million, is in the health niche. So you can go into different niches, and it will be beneficial to your career in the long run if you do. But I wouldn't give up on, on financial just because you think it's in a slump. There's actually a massive opportunity to have your biggest winner of all time because you can crack that code. You can figure out what people need to hear now. And, you know, you'll have one of the biggest winners of all time if you can do it. Now, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know you that well, Gabriel, but uh, if, if you want to stay in financial, if you're very interested in financial stuff, then stay in that niche. But also, don't be afraid to expand out. I don't think once you have a, a decent reputation as a copywriter, there's no reason not to expand into other niches. So I hope that answers your question. Tom asks, I have a membership site that I'm reopening next month. The members love it, but it's only been live for six months, so I don't have a lot of big this changed my life stories yet. There just hasn't been enough time. So what's the best way to get testimonials for my new promotion? All right, I love this question. It's kind of tactical. There's a few ways to get testimonials that have worked out really well for me and my clients in the past. Uh, the first way is just send out a survey. You can do this on Google Docs. Uh, there's a, a Google Forms, actually, I think it is. Or you can do something like SurveyMonkey or one of the other ones. And you just ask a lot of uh, broad-based questions. So, you know, he has a few hundred members in his membership site already. So it's already somewhat successful. Uh, and he's made a lot of money from it. But you could send a survey to all of the members that have bought and just ask fairly general questions. So start out with some demographic ones, like what's your age range, what's your gender, all that type of stuff, just to get a feel for who's in the audience. And then ask just very broad questions, like, if you could improve this membership experience, what would it look like? What have you loved most about this membership experience that you've been in? You know, what has been the number one most, you know, helpful feature? What What's your biggest win from being in this membership? And then make sure you ask for their name and email at the end. And what you're going to find is you have a certain number of people who are hyper responders. So they're going to send you not just like a sentence or two in each. They're going to send you, you know, hundreds of words. They're going to write paragraphs. Then you want to follow up with those people because uh, this person has, you know, is fairly well known. They're going to, if, if he gets on the phone personally or on a Zoom call personally with them, these people are going to just rant and rave with him because they're showing off to the, you know, the person they look up to. But they're also genuinely telling you about what they loved most about this experience, and you're going to get great testimonials like that. Now, there's some other ways to get testimonials. I know he had a live event where this this. It kind of went wrong on the video testimonials he was supposed to get. And the person that was asking the questions asked about how they liked the event, not how they liked the membership. So those kind of bombed. So one thing you could also do is get people to come on a live uh, Zoom call with you. So you get all your members. You can get you know, 100, 200 members on this, this Zoom call. And then have people share their biggest wins. You're, you don't need 500 testimonials from all your members. You just need... 5, 10, 15 that are really impactful. So if you get people on there sharing their wins, you're going to get to be able to record these and, and get a lot of good testimonials at the end. So just ask, what are your biggest wins? You know, some people are just going to come on and say, it's just been great to be a part of the community. And that's great because that actually encourages other people to jump on the Zoom and share their own stories. But you're going to get a few that are just stories you didn't even know because people are kind of shy. They don't want to talk. They want to talk. They're a little scared to talk. But if they see a few other people doing it and then they think theirs is better or just that they have something to share, they're going to get on and you're going to get a lot of good testimonials. And testimonial collection, as anybody that's run a business or any copywriter knows, is extremely important. They're, they're great strategic assets for any business. So I love this question. Uh, thanks for asking. Josh asks, why did you quit copywriting? 
I asked because I know you said you made seven figures a year doing it, and I wonder why you walked away from it. I also asked because I'm trying to decide whether to go further down the Agora road or stay independent. I've been making around 250K a year for the last three years, but I feel stuck and I want to grow to 500K. But I'm not sure if copy is the best way to do it. I'm thinking of launching my own products. So the reason I quit copywriting is because, well, first of all, I could. <laughs> I, I put away enough money that I have a few years of leeway where I can kind of relax and not do anything, but I don't want to retire. I was just burnt out on writing copy, especially financial copy. It's very intense. Uh, there takes It takes a lot of research to get it done. And I just, you know, at a certain point, when you have a certain amount of money in the bank, it's not about making more money. My So there's three reasons for having money that I talk about. There's uh, power. Power is one reason to accumulate wealth, and I think it's a bad reason. There's status. Uh, I see a lot of people that try to make money for status, and it's a, it's a never-ending treadmill. There's always somebody ahead of you that you start chasing. So I think status is a terrible reason to really focus on for accumulating wealth. And then there's freedom. And for me, freedom has always been the thing that I've wanted. I don't want to have a boss. I don't want to be restricted in the things I do. And so wealth is one way of, of attaining freedom. And I've attained a certain level of freedom. The other thing is, like, over the past two and a half years or so, we have seen that our government can go totalitarian at any moment. Now, I've accumulated a certain skill set. <laughs> I sound like Liam Neeson right now. I have a certain set of skills. Um, but I, I have, I do have a certain set of skills, and I would rather use that promoting businesses and working with businesses that promote liberty than just selling more stock tips to people. So for me, for personal fulfillment, and because I have the option of doing it, I wanted to step away from copywriting. Now, thinking of launching your own products, I, you know, Josh is a, a an accomplished copywriter already. Uh, he has good clients, he has a skill set, he's doing well, but it depends on what type of product you want to launch, Josh. I would say if you have an offer that is copywriting related, you're walking into a, <laughs> a, a pit of snakes trying to promote it. Now, that's not to say you can't do it, but it's to say that there's a lot of crap out there teaching people how to write copy, and I mean crap. There's some good products, but all like, there's not a need for another how to write copy course. If you have a specific skill set, a specific niche within copywriting, that's one thing. But there's a lot of other things you can do. You know, in the next few months, I'm launching a membership site that's part of the purpose is uh, that there's a copywriting section on it that's teaching copywriters how to become consultants, how to grow their income that way. Because I think a lot, a lot of small businesses really could use somebody that understands copy to come consult with them. And you can charge, you know, $500, $1,000 an hour for that type of consulting. So I want to teach people how to do that. And that's one way to grow your income. But yeah, having an offer is actually good if it's an offer that you believe in and you're unique, um, uniquely able to present. So if you have a hobby or a uh, another skill besides copywriting, I talk about the um, talent stack all the time, Scott Adams concept. And I think if you have another talent in there that you can sell to people and, and teach them how to do, having an offer is a great way to do it. And you don't even need to ditch your current clients to do it. So you can you can start slowly and build from there. So I would say, yes, having an offer is a great thing. I would not encourage you to be another copywriting coach that teaches copywriters how to become copywriting coaches. I think that's done to death. I know you can make money doing it, but like you have to sleep at night too. So it all depends on you. If you have a product that you want to launch that you think you can help people and add value to their life, I would do that. But, you know, 250K a year for a copywriter is pretty good. And 500K a year is really only product selection away. So if you get to pick the products you work on or come up with better ideas, you can get there fairly easily. 500K for a copywriter. I know this sounds insane, but 500K for a copywriter is not out of reach for somebody that's already making 250k you've proved you have the skills you've proved you can do it now it's just picking better promotions to write picking better products to write for 
and maybe renegotiating some contract stuff, but you can do that. So Christian asks, with your experience as a direct response copywriter, what is the most counterintuitive lesson you've learned about markets or a specific market? I think the most counterintuitive thing that I've learned through basically every market that I've worked with in health or finance or biz op or you know entertainment or there's been a lot of industries I've been in is that you can't just relay facts. People don't care, no matter how fascinating the fact may be, people don't care about facts. You have to wrap it in a story. It has to be presented in an entertaining manner. You know, you could tell people that I have a plan that is scientifically proven to make you lose 50 pounds in 10 days. But if you don't tell it in a story, they're not going to believe you and they're not going to care. So it's just, I want, you know, I'm a very, in my personal life, I'm a very straightforward person. I just want to tell you what I know. But I've learned, especially in public speaking, is that you can't just relay information. It has to be wrapped up in some form of entertainment. People need entertainment in their in their copy and anything they're going to pay attention to for a long time. Uh, you can't just sell them the the straight facts. And I, you know, a lot of guys especially go into this hole where we just want to tell you what we know. Like we we know this amazing thing, and in our brain it's contextualized so it makes sense. But if you don't wrap it in a story, it doesn't matter if you say I have a secret treasure map that'll I'll take you to the the biggest pot of gold you've ever met seen in your life. Uh, if you don't wrap it in a story of how that leprechaun gave it to you, you know, it's just not going to get across. So, yeah, I think the most counterintuitive thing is that you can't be so direct in copy because we want to be direct. But you have to be somewhat indirect, which is why there's a lesson I talk about called misdirection, where in the beginning of a promotion, you have to kind of leave some red herrings of answers that could be the solution to the big promise you made. But only one of them, because well, only one of them will work, because people want to try to figure it out, and that's what keeps them engaged throughout the copy. John asks, "Part of the machine is the statutory treadmill imposed by taxes and regulations of civil government in the U.S. Where I live, real estate taxes vary widely from state to state. For instance, your home in Pennsylvania—that's my home in Pennsylvania—is likely taxed at three or four times what it would be in Tennessee." Puerto Rico provides enormous income tax benefits for a business like yours. On the other hand, PA may provide more access to amenities not available in Tennessee or Puerto Rico. Since you could work from anywhere, what criteria did you use to settle where you did? And what's your recommendation? What's your recommended decision matrix for the rest of us? Well, I can, I can tell you my own decision matrix for this. The number one thing for me is being reasonably close to my friends and family. I don't want to have to make an entire new network. I really like my friends. You know, I have seven nieces and nephews. I really love to see them every month or two. It's just not the same if I have to get on a plane because I'm only going to do that once or twice a year. So I want to be close to my friends and family. The second criteria for me is that there's activities that I want to do. You know, I live in the mountains of Pennsylvania. I love to go kayaking. I love to go fishing. In the winter, I go snowboarding, you know, at least four or five times a week. And I'm very close to a couple mountains that I have season passes to. So the availability of the activities and the things that I want to do is very important to me. I think the third criteria would be the freedoms that are allowed in that area. Now, you know, we can talk all day about our God-given rights, but there's places like New Jersey where I could never live because they won't let me have my guns. I love to go shoot my guns. I, I you know, I can make all the cases for self-defense for the Second Amendment, but I really have a lot of fun shooting guns, and I don't want to have to go through, jump through all the hoops that New Jersey makes you jump through to try and have guns and be on the register and do all that stuff. So I think the level of freedom would be the third. And then fourth, it's actually fairly low down on my list, would be the taxes and, and costs of living. I had a friend a couple of years ago. We were in a car driving to a dinner we were going to, and him and his wife were talking about how they were uh, trying to cut down 20% on their budget. They were, you know, they wanted, they had a couple things they wanted to do, uh, and they just wanted to, to save up the money for it. And my suggestion to them was like, you know, he's an entrepreneur. I was like, why don't you just make twenty percent more in your business? And it had like never occurred to him that that was an option. And then we walked through a couple ways that he could do it, and he eventually, you know, he doubled his business after that. Not not through me, he did it himself. I like to think I I had some influence, but it was all him. But I mean, so when you're a copywriter or or someone in a freelance or consulting position you really have a lot of control over your income and how much you work. 
can determine and, and, and the structures of your deals and all that can determine how much money you make. So I don't want to let taxes get in my way. Um, now for other people, uh, if you're not an entrepreneur, I, I, you know, it really depends on your values. I can't tell you which thing to value more. I, you know, the, the thing that I value most is, is friends and family, my network, uh, and then my freedoms. What, what do I want to do and what am I allowed to do? And then, you know, money comes in. It, if I was taxed at a hundred percent, you know, over whatever number here, like if it was a hundred percent income tax after $200,000 or whatever the AOCs of the world want to do. Yeah. I wouldn't live there. It doesn't matter that that's the closest place to my family. I just couldn't tolerate that. It would drive me crazy. But for the most part, I don't think money, as long as you're above, you know, subsistence, subsistence level, money shouldn't be the primary factor in where you live. I think friends and family and your freedoms should really be what you're making your decision on. And the states that have the most freedoms tend to have the lower tax rates. So you're kind of winning either way there. But that would be my answer to that question. Chris asks, what's the best performing subject line you've ever come up with and why did it work so well? So I'm gonna kind of cheat on this at first and then I'll give you uh, from my own email list, my best subject line. The best subject line I've ever seen anywhere, the best performing is a subject line written by Jed Canty when he was doing the Bitcoin promotion we did back in 2013. Uh, and the subject line was 36 cities dump the dollar. Now, it worked very, very well. I think, first of all, because the curiosity on that is enormous. Like, what does that even mean that they're dumping the dollar? And I think it also works because we're going to more conservative lists. And everybody in the conservative and libertarian political world knows that the dollar is a scam. So that type of uh, you're tapping into a consciousness, a, a, a con an idea that everybody already holds that the dollar is going to fail eventually. I think most conservatives and libertarians believe that on some level. So the fact that it's happening to, to show that it's happening is something that got a lot of people interested. And that subject line had like a 70% open rate. It was just absurd. And that's in 2013. So before all the shenanigans of Google automatically marking things red and stuff. Um, the best subject line I've personally ever done is uh, with my own email list. When I launched this podcast, it was the I quit copywriting subject line. I think the reason it did so well is that it's kind of counterintuitive. I'm known as a copywriter. Uh, so when I said I'm quitting copy, I quit copywriting, it was a curiosity that people had to find out about and it was relevant. So with the same thing with the dump the dollar that was going to financial lists and then I quit copywriting that was going to a copywriting list. So something that goes against people's expectations and gets a lot of curiosity going is going to work pretty well. Sohail asks, can I be on the show, please? Now, for those of you that don't know, Sohail is uh, somebody I had Money Map hire to work under me. So I know him pretty well. Uh, we've been working together for a few years. And, you know, he's one of the up and comers to watch out for. He's going to be one of those superstars in the future. So, Sohail, yes, you could be on the show. I would love to interview you. But more importantly, anybody else that's listening to this, if you have an interesting story, if you have a path that you've taken to kind of disconnect yourself from the, you know, norms of society in any way. Uh, it could be business, it could be medical, it could be any way in your personal life. I want to get some health people on to talk to us. Uh, I would love to have you on the show. Send me an email to henry at henrybingman.com. Uh, just kind of tell me your story and then we can work it out. Dan asks, in a long form sales letter, is the body portion of the letter all about overcoming objections the reader might have and making them believe you have the answers to their problems? I would say overcoming objections is something you have to do periodically throughout the sales letter. It is a major portion of a sales letter, but the body, the main body is more about building up the product to be something bigger and bigger in the prospect's mind. I, I have a, a somewhat famous, infamous, whatever you want to call it, uh, talk I did a, a few years ago on the seven stories that every sales letter needs. And the first one is the paradigm shift, which is just the world was this way. And after you read it, you're going to realize, after you read this letter, you'll realize the world is a new way. It's the guru superpowers is the second story, which is just making your, the, the voice and the hero of your promo bigger than life, larger than life. The third one is the shocking discovery, which is kind of how your guru discovered this product. And then the body copy is basically what I call escalations, which is you're taking it from 
base level to, you know, oh man, this is way more exciting than I thought. Oh, it has another benefit. Oh, it has another benefit. So I would say the body portion of the letter is all about building up the excitement for the product. And in the process of that, a lot of objections are going to occur. And you have to overcome those as they occur. So if you say something like this, I'll just go back to one of my health letters, uh, doing this activity raises your metabolic rate by 20%. You're going to have some, you know, you're going to show the scientific proof for that. And then you're going to have some objections like, well, why haven't I heard of this before? Or, you know, that can't be true. And then you have to go in and dig into those objections. So you, you answer objections as they come up. But the body copy, you don't want to spend your whole promotion trying to overcome objections. You want to spend your whole promotion making the product seem invaluable, that they can't do without this in their life if they have whatever specific problem your promo is solving. So no, the body isn't about overcoming objections, although you're going to have to do a lot of that in the body of the promo. I hope that makes sense. A different Christian asks, <laughs> coming up with new ideas slash angles for lifts. For this, uh, lifts are, by the way, emails promoting the promo. That's a very Agora slang word. Uh, but coming up for new ideas for uh, emails to promote the same promotion. Say I was assigned 20 different uh, lifts for the same promo. What's the best way to come up with new ideas and become more creative? You know, I did a talk to Clayton Makepeace's audience a few years ago about coming up with a big idea. And I think in general, when you're coming up with new email ideas, it's the same concept. So in that talk, I talked about the eight questions to ask. Uh, the first one is, what's the audience's state of awareness and stage of sophistication? That's basically just asking, what does the audience already know? So you know how to reach them where they're at. The second question was, can I make the idea broader, which is just expanding it out? Can you, can you find a more widely applicable application for that big idea that, that the promo is based on? The opposite then is question three is, can I make the idea more specific? So narrow down on one tiny point in it and, and try to work from that. Uh, can you make it more believable? So offering more proof points. Can you make it more urgent, which is just, hey, there's a date, there's a timeline, there's this big reason you have to act now. Can I make it uh, an experience in itself? So can you broaden it out so there's something in here? Like a lot of times if it's a, a webinar, you can have a, a make it a live event that you have to just be at. Um, you know, there, <laughs> question seven is my favorite one. It's what if I just made stuff up? So go, what's the wildest idea you can think of? And then go see if you can find a way to back that up and tie it into the promotion. And then, you know, the, uh, for the big idea is can you, the idea itself carry the promo, which isn't actually applicable to emails. If you want to see the, the whole talk I did on the big idea and get all of these uh, eight questions with the examples and the, the entire context, you can just go to henryb.co slash idea uh, and that you can opt in and get the, the entire talk for free. This was given to people that paid $5,000 to attend. So this is a great bonus. If you want to go, that's just henryb.co slash idea. Uh, one of the easiest ways for emails and one of the things I, I lean back on all the time when I'm promoting stuff for the you know 10th, 20th time is, is there something topical in the news that you can address and then turn into the promo? So you, you start out with whatever the top news story of the day is. It might be a Supreme Court decision. It might be, you know, a big event that just happened uh, that's in the news. You know, I don't know if there's a solar eclipse or something. And then t find a way towards the end to twist it into your promotion, so to tie that idea into the promotion. Ben Settle's really good at this. There's a lot of copywriters that have this great ability to just turn almost any idea into a turn to the promotion. Now, you get lower click-throughs on that, but you get higher opens, so it kind of balances out throughout the promo. And then the last question we have today. Uh, Nuwara, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, has just a general question about how to get started in copywriting. There are four books slash courses I generally recommend to new copywriters. My favorite copywriting course, you know, I got started with AWAI's accelerated program for six-figure copywriting. I think that's how a lot of copywriters got started, at least back in the, you know, 2000s, <laughs> back in the, making myself a dinosaur now, apparently. Um, and that's a good course. I, I would still say there's a lot of good stuff in there. The course I got the most from was John Carlton's Kick-Ass Copywriting Secrets of a Marketing Rebel. I just listened to the, you know, it came with a bunch of uh, audio tapes and I listened to them on repeat while I was driving to my job at the time. One of the other books I recommend is Harry Brown's The Secret of Selling Anything. It just really gives you a great concept of, of value. 
Uh, it's, you know, it's a very Misesian type concept. So you're getting to the core of what value is and why people appreciate things and why people buy things. I think that's just a psychological primer on why people buy and how to make a good offer. So I always recommend that book. So you could you could look at Dan Kennedy's Ultimate Sales Letter. I think that's a good nuts and bolts fundamental. And Dan's a great writer, and it's it's entertaining to read. Um, Influence by Robert Cialdini. People like to think copywriting is all about the writing. The truth is, copywriting is all about the psychology. It's why do consumers do the things they do, and how can you convince them to do the thing you want them to do, which is buy the product. So there's just a lot of really interesting psychological research in there. And, you know, he went and followed a bunch of marketers and salespeople around and saw, observed, and documented what makes people do things and then explained it from a psychological basis. So Influence is must reading, must uh, it's a must read book for any entrepreneur or copywriter. And then, of course, the Bible of copywriting is Breakthrough Advertising by Eugene Schwartz. I just had Brian Kurtz, the publisher and, you know, a former mentee of Eugene Schwartz on the podcast last week. So I highly recommend you go back and listen to that episode if you missed it. But it just explains the cycle of markets in a way that nobody else has done it before. Uh, it's one of the most brilliant books on marketing and advertising and just human psychology that I think has ever been written. Uh, and he was one of the most successful copywriters of all time. We all owe, you know, all copywriters owe a debt to Eugene Schwartz. He taught us a lot of the techniques and methods that we all use today. And of course, you can get free shipping on the book if you go to henryb.co slash BA. Uh, that only lasts till next Friday. So you have one week left. If you want to get that free shipping and uh, half off shipping internationally, go get that book. So that's where I would start. All right, this has been a lot of fun. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm always open to feedback. Just email me at henry at henrybingaman.com, and I'll talk to you next week.